All right, excellent. Uh, so hello, everyone, and welcome to Alien Talk. I'm your host, Stuart, with my co-host, Ted Royce. Um, now, Ted, for people who don't know your story, let's start at the beginning, okay? Uh, so let's take, you, take people back to the start of Masquerade of Angels. So when did your contacts first start, Ted? Actually, they, for people who have read my story, uh, it actually began when I was a child. However, I did not know I was having alien visits until I, I became an adult and I was involved in a neighborhood abduction, which a group of, of us were taken at one time. And that was when, uh, Carla Turner and Barbara Barthley became involved in, in my case. And it was at, at this point through the help of these ladies that I actually recognized that what was going on with me was not angels that I had thought I was being visited with throughout my life, but rather it was UFOs and aliens. And that put a whole different light on everything for me. And Ted, let's, let's take people back to that abduction experience. Um, can you tell the story again, just for people who, who might not know your story? Uh, uh, we're talking about the neighborhood. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> what happened was, uh, my employer had transferred me from West Texas to Louisiana and I had, uh, been on uh, a, a living in a mobile home because the company I worked for moved me around a bit. So it was easier for me to just have a mobile home. And I had just been moved to Louisiana and had been set up in this mobile home park and uh, had been there only a, a, few, a, few, a few months. And I had started doing... Uh, some psychic readings, uh, in a local metaphysical bookstore. And I had talked with a bunch of people about aliens and UFOs and what have you, and listened to a lot of different opinions and was uncertain about it all. But I thought at that time that, uh, or I had no reason to think they were not benevolent. Uh, uh, that, that was my feeling at that time, although I wasn't convinced of it, but, uh, moving on, on with that, uh, I had uh, just been in this particular, uh, mobile home spot when, uh, uh, we were having several days of, of, of rain and stormy weather. It, it was in April, uh, I believe it was April and, uh, I had been having difficulty sleeping at night, but I thought the, the angels were bothering me. They were coming at night and touching me. And I felt like I was floating out of my body a few times and, uh, I would wake up frightened, scared, and I couldn't understand why angels were doing this to me. And, and I kind of had a, an outburst of anger because my body was becoming exhausted from all of this going on with me. And, uh, so I had in a bout of anger, I had, uh, kind of screamed and yelled out to myself, uh, you know, leave me alone, you know, go bother the neighbors, quit bothering me. I need to sleep. I need to rest. And then, uh, I think it was that very night that, uh, while I was asleep, they came and there again, I, th I, I, I thought it was angels. However, now Ted, uh, Ted, what, what exactly did you see when they came? Okay. I, uh, the most vivid thing to me was, uh, my bedroom wall, uh, opened up like a kaleidoscope. It just separated into a, a round kind of shimmering, uh, 
uh, invisible form there. You, it was kind of wavy, like you'd see heat rising from a hot highway in the summertime. Uh, it was like that, but I could see outside. And then uh, three little figures that I would now say at that time, I, I didn't know what to think, but it, but I would now say they were grazed from their size and their description of what I saw. Now, I was consciously a, awake during this this time, Stuart. I was not uh, a, asleep. And they zapped me with something that sort of stunned me or, or uh, as I use the, ex the expression now, they put me on pause because I was kind of like uh, uh, frozen. I couldn't move. Yeah. And, and then I'm they brought up, it looked like uh, something that reminded me like these uh, beach people used to surf on these beach boards. It was something kind of flat, but uh, uh, they took me through the wall to the outside, which was only, you know, a couple of feet and put me on this board and we rode across the drive area and and through a, a, a behind some other mobile homes and there was a a, a, a hedgerow of trees kind of like a thick forest right there we just kind of went like right through it uh and then I remembered being taken into something that uh, there seemed to be something like a, uh, a light blue force field all, all around this. And I was aware that other people were, were being brought uh, in, in a similar fashion from some of the other mobile homes there. And then I don't remember anything else uh, until after uh, a, a, you know a, a very long time later that I was under hypnosis with with uh, Barbara Barthlick uh, uh, that, that's all I can recall at this particular time about that story and Ted um, you said the uh, the beings hit you with some sort of uh, blue light was it well, Yes, it seemed like there, there, from my conscience memory, it seemed like there was a very, very light, almost like a night light on. Yeah. Uh, and it, it seemed to kind of uh, have a, a, a very light bluish tint to everything. Yeah. And you didn't happen, was this some kind of device that they were using or did it emanate from them themselves? Uh, I honestly don't know. Yeah, I don't know. And Ted, when you have an experience like this and then you wake up the following morning, how does that feel? Is it just confusion or is it you just had this strange dream last night? Well, I wanted uh, uh, I, I tried the next day to remember more of it. I knew that something had happened. Uh, but I couldn't detail it. Uh, I did remember being taken through the wall. I did remember being taken, uh, through this hedge grove. I did remember seeing other people being taken also, but then, uh, and, and, and I do remember being crowded in light to a small room with these other people. Yeah. Uh, but we were somewhat in like a, a zombie state. Uh, we were just kind of uh, catatonic. Yeah, so, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, nobody was talking. Nobody was moving. We, we were being manipulated. We were being, uh, they were moving us. They were doing just what they wanted. And I say they, uh, there again, at that point, uh, I, for lack of knowledge in this field, I thought I was being visited by angels. I didn't know of anything else to call it. Yeah. And um, just for people listening, uh, I just want to give a, an example of the level of control that these beings have. Um, I remember once that Dr. Carla Turner was talking about her own experiences and uh, they were having these nightly intrusions. Uh, her and her husband were in bed they heard a strange clicking noise 
both of them were up alert looking around couldn't see anything she checked the clock it said 2 a.m on the clock they waited a couple of minutes and then her husband elton said maybe we should just go back to sleep and she checked the clock again and it was 2 45 there's 45 hour or 45 minutes there of missing time um, I just wanted to give the listeners an example of the level of control that these beings have uh, to be able to take two people in their bed while they're up and alert and expecting something is incredible. Um, now, Ted, you've experienced this level of control as well, haven't you? Particularly with that night that the Greys took you. In your own words, can you describe what that what that's like? What it felt like? Yeah, this... Uh, uh, this other presence uh, pretty much controlling you. I remember feeling terrified. Yeah. I, I felt helpless. I felt that any control I had had been taken away from me. And I didn't know what was going on. I, 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 I thought the next morning, you know, I even wondered, I had a fleeting moment of wondering uh, if I had died or was dying at that, at that particular time. Yeah. But there again, uh, I, I felt like the, the, I, my brain had been like a computer. It had been put on pause. So I wasn't able to keep thinking independently. It's like everything was frozen. Yeah. And do you think this is some sort of psychic ability that they have or it's their technology? I think it's, uh, well, I, I have certain feelings that I have, have come about over the years regarding the psychic part of it. Uh, but I believe technology is uh, the, the, the main ingredient in in their ability to perform these things right okay now the something did come to my mind when that uh i'm afraid i'll lose it if i don't bring this up at this moment uh but when you were making reference to carla turner and her husband and the missing time uh and they heard this clicking noise I, uh that triggered something that i i feel like is very important and uh and dealing with situations where people hear the clicking noise and i have learned over the years that before they enter someone's bedroom or enter their house they send in little little balls that are kind of glowing and sometimes they're a little bit uh orange in color yeah. uh, i have seen them gray uh but i've had them come right up within a foot of my face and over the spears are little tiny lens all over and they're constantly taking pictures and you hear this clicking noise because what it's doing is it's preparing the intruders uh to when it's safe for them to come in with with the least resistance yeah so their surveillance cameras actually is what they're doing here and uh uh that has happened to me more than one time i'm very familiar with that process yeah right um now uh, before this experience happened you were having uh spirit guides visit you um uh, I'm trying to think, was it described as spirit guides in your book or did you use a different name? Well, here again, I've, I've changed my viewpoint on a lot of this as I worked with Carla Turner and Barbara Barthlick and we did a lot of hypnotic regressions. Uh, my viewpoint on the, the spirit uh, participation in this, my, I do believe the spirits are real and I do believe we can be visited by them, but I do know for a fact that the aliens use this with their own technology, uh, to make us think 
that we are being visited by a loved one so that they can control us better. Yeah. Yeah. And see- in other words, they create something like a hologram to, to make one think that they are actually seeing a spirit, but, uh, it's just a gimmick they use to get better control. Yeah. It's a bit interesting because of the level of control that these beings have, that they would have to use things like this. Uh, it almost seems to me that they're afraid of something being figured out that human beings will figure out uh, how to get past this, uh, this control. So they have to use these kind of holograms, these gimmicks as well to just fully convince the person that what they're seeing is real when in fact it isn't. That's very true. Yeah. I concur with that. Ted, when was the first time you met one of these spirit guides? I, I, at this moment, I'm, I'm, I'm not certain about when I, I remember seeing spirits as a teenager. Yeah. But I didn't always know who they were. Yeah. Uh, at that time, family members were not showing themselves to me. And I think the reason they weren't was because I didn't have any training or background in that area and they weren't sure how to react to it. Yeah. Uh, but I do remember seeing other spirits that I, I had no idea who they were. And I remember waking up a few times as a teenager and having entities standing uh, in my room, like at the foot of my bed and talking to me. And usually the conversation would be very limited. Uh, it was telepathic and, uh, they would be saying something to me to get me to relax. Yeah. Uh, it's usually, uh, we mean, you no harm. Yeah. That's usually one of the things they say, right. um, uh, or go back to sleep. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about Jill for a little bit. Okay. Now, Jill was your friend that you grew up with in uh, Alabama and you, the aliens told you that you and Jill were supposed to be together. You were uh, soulmates. Is that correct? Well, I'm not sure of the details uh, on what they verbally or telepathically communicated to me about Jill was uh, we we associated at school, but we were not, we, we were not dating. Uh, we, we didn't really have classes together. I really spent no time with Jill outside of the fact that when I saw her, we always smiled at each other and it was kind of comforting, but there wasn't anything, uh, in my opinion, at that time out the extraordinary uh, between the two of us until that night that the angel, so to speak, came took me out of the house out on uh, uh to uh maybe a couple hundred feet from the house to the edge of, of of the school playground and there was uh there again uh at, at that i was a teenager so i didn't um i didn't realize that it was a ufo uh, I had no idea until hypnosis, uh, with Barbara Barthlick years later, but, uh, several of, of my school classmates, young people, my age were there on board and they had me and they had Jill inside something like a, uh, a big tube that it was like liquid in it's like we were floating in inside that tube and it, it, it was kind of lit up uh here again it was a uh, kind of a bluish color uh, again uh everything was kind of a very light bluish color however the liquid in the tube was uh, a light greenish color and uh I was in one and I remembered seeing Jill in the other. We recognized each other. Um, 
but we we were separated by the tube so we weren't touching each other but this figure that i thought was an angel took something like a a tube a little small tube like you were going to siphon uh of some liquid out of something and took some of it out of out of her tube and siphoned it over into the tube that i was in and immediately when i began to feel this energy that was passing over into me immediately i began to have this absolutely very warm energetic feeling very loving very spirited it, it was uh it was one of the most wonderful feelings i've ever had and then after this event was over uh and days to come uh i i remembered it i didn't have to be under hypnosis i remembered that happened but i, I remembered they did not take any of, of the substance out of my tube and put into hers. Only hers was taken and put into mine. So after that, I developed uh, this insane obsession of, of, of love with her. And right. So we're talking about more alien manipulation here. Um, well, yes. Uh, and I also for the listeners, uh, and for you, Stuart, in case you're not aware, uh, there is a book called, uh, oh my goodness, I've lost the name of it, uh, The Love Bite. And I, th I think I saw that a while back on, uh, on Amazon, but they talk about this case of mine in this book and, uh, and how other people have come forward that have experienced something similar in which they develop love obsessions in the, in the very, very same manner, maybe not hundred percent identical, but the f same format, so to speak. And, uh, that's what the love bite is about. And why is it done? Uh, why was that done to me? Why didn't Jill receive the same feelings that for me as i felt about her but it was not there it was never there right and why do you think that is um why why was it in their interest to uh have you experienced this love but well, not jill i don't know the answer that i have ideas but i i don't i don't know for sure the answer to that one thing is i suffered emotionally for this for years this yeah. happened when i was about 15, 14 or 15 years old. And I, it took me until in my twenties to get past this and let it go. And I suffered it, uh, emotionally and, and it was very difficult at times for me to love somebody so deeply and was not receiving any of that love in return. Uh, so I have an idea that, uh, it was done to create some type of energy that, that they were harvesting off of this emotional trauma for me. Now that's, that's where I am today with this. Okay. Yeah. I want to, uh, take you back to, uh, your grandmother, the very first experience you documented in masquerade of angels, uh, where you heard a strange voice at night. When you asked who it was, your grandmother replied, that was the devil. Okay. Well, <clears throat> what unfolded there was, uh, we, I, I was only nine and a half, 10 years old. Uh, the grandmother had come to visit and we lived in a small house. And so because of my age, I slept in the bed with my grandmother and during the night, I remembered lots of loud talking and yelling and, uh, it, it was, uh, very traumatizing for me. I woke up, uh, frightened with all of this, but, uh, 
went back to sleep the very next morning, you know, uh, my grandmother is already up and she's sitting in the dining room talking to my mother and I came in from waking up and I, I, I walk in and I go to her and I ask her point blank. And I remember this very clearly what happened last night that there was all that yelling going on in the bedroom. And she looked at me in shock, like she couldn't believe I was saying this to her. And then she took me in her arms and she hugged me and she said, Teddy, don't worry about it. I took care of it. It was the devil. And uh, so your grandmother was most likely an abductee herself. Yes. This was probably going on all her life. And then this being uh, something that's generational uh, then was passed on to you. Yes. So is there anyone else in your family who is currently going through these same experiences? No, not that I'm aware of. However, I do have some family members who are somewhat psychic. Uh, uh, I have several family members. Okay. And uh, how, how, how does that come true? Uh, are they just able to, uh, like when you were on your way to that uh, ski resort and you kept seeing the yellow bus? Is it just synchronicities like that? Well, you're, you're making reference to uh, when I was taken to Sun Valley, Idaho? Yes. To the ski resort. That's right, yeah. Okay, the only answer, and Barbara and, and Carla Turner were in agreement with me. They took me into my own future. Right, so... They were showing you images from your future. And well, I, 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 I actually, I was taken. Uh, it was physical for me because I felt it. Yeah. And I remembered being taken through the walls again uh, into something that we moved ext- at, at like faster than the speed of sound it was like nothing but streaks of light we were moving so fast and then that's when i plopped down inside the yellow bus that was traveling into sun valley right and so for your family members who are displaying kind of the psychic ability is this more alien manipulation like it isn't really them but it's them kind of aiding Oh, sorry, when I say them, I meant your family members, but it's the aliens making it happen. Well, uh, from my opinion, where I am today, Stuart, yeah, it was all done for their benefit. They baited me with the excitement of going to this place and making these things happen as I got aged and and got older, these things happen in order to captivate my interest, uh, to move me along, to become what they wanted me to become. Yeah. So it, 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 it was not, uh, just an at random event that happened because of my psychic ability uh in my opinion they were driving the whole thing to make it happen yeah and you've no idea why like what the end game was well i think we're we're doing it today right getting the information out there that's right it's been building up to this for years right um ted is is there anything you want to say at this point about your your past experiences right up to that uh, abduction uh, with involving the neighbors? Is there anything else that you feel that's important to say? Well, at a later time, I will disclose uh, more information that came out of, about the neighborhood abduction that uh, we learned during the hypnotic regressions. Uh, uh, I'm not at liberty to discuss that at the moment for simply reason there are other people involved and I'd like to talk to them first. Oh, interesting. Yes. Uh, so uh, at a later time, I, I, I can 
share more details on that that I learned uh, through Barbara Bartlett and the hypnotic regressions. But I will I will say this <clears throat> uh, at point of interest. Uh, after that event, uh, I, I was living in Shreveport, Louisiana, and uh, Barksdale Air Force Base is uh, adjoining Shreveport. It's a extremely large facility. Uh, immediately after this neighborhood abduction, we had in our neighborhood unmarked military jeeps uh humvees etc traveling around our neighborhood day and night right shortly after that there were two unmarked planes jet planes from the airport which uh, you could see them sitting out there on the tarmac at, at certain times but they were about the size of dc 10s uh, and they were unmarked tinted windows and these planes flew over our neighborhood day and night until people in that part of the town started complaining. And now this is rumor, but I heard that they actually got the governor of the state of Louisiana involved to stop this uh, maneuvers, uh, military maneuvers or whatever was going on. Of course, Barksdale claimed they knew absolutely nothing about it as the military is famous for doing. Yeah. But I, I just wanted the listeners to know that this was taking place. So obviously what happened with this neighborhood abduction, I would say probably showed up on Barksdale's radar. Yeah, um, it's interesting how they know that a, an abduction event has happened as well. Say, I remember uh, Dr. Carter Turner, Turner talking about in her book Taken, uh, a lady called Pat, who was 14 years old. Uh, they lived in a farmhouse. After an, an abduction event, these covert uh, men in black, for, for lack of a better word, showed up the day after the event. Uh, and how did they know? It's it's nearly, there was a man called Phil, Phil Schneider and many others who came out saying that there was a treaty between the government and the aliens where the aliens would be able to abduct so many people as long as the government knew exactly who were abducted, who they were abducting. So to me, that kind of lends credence to that theory. But at the same time, I these beings can just do whatever they want anyway. I don't, I don't see why they would have to form a treaty with governments. You know, it just, there's so much of this that doesn't make sense, but the question is out there. Maybe some listeners want to get in contact with us. How did they know that this abduction event had happened? But it affected, uh, not only myself, but it did affect my neighbors. Uh, a couple of neighbors, uh, who were involved, uh, sold their, their mobile homes and moved almost immediately. Uh, uh, here again, one, one neighbor, uh, a gentleman uh, who lived uh, across from me, uh, he, he was there on a work assignment from California, he and his wife, and uh, he was an educated man. Uh, I, I, I talked to him at length, but after that night, he was terrified of heights. Right. Wouldn't even stand in a chair. He was so terrified of heights. Okay. He woke up. He would wake up in the night screaming uh, that, he, that he was going to fall. Uh, and now details on that at a later time will come out. But right now I have to get permission from some of the other people involved before I can reveal this. And I hope everyone understands. I, I don't want to uh, infringe upon anyone's privacy. Oh yeah, of course. I'm, I'm sure a lot of people will understand that Ted. And then another neighbor, uh, that I want to identify, uh, took 
was obsessed after that night of taking baths. Uh, he, his wife said she'd wake up two or three o'clock in the morning and, and he would be in a bathtub soaking and crying. Okay. What, why so, did, Ted? I, 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 the point I'm trying to make is some people were traumatized. Yeah. By this. Yeah. Uh, it does. A lot of people do experience trauma from this. Uh, they don't know what's going on. They can't quite believe it themselves. Uh, they can't really tell anyone because people would think they're crazy. There's well, so yeah. many. There's so many debunk debunkers who come out and say that these people are after fame. But well, yeah, I'm, I'm sure you've you've heard that, Ted. Have you? Oh, I have. I've 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 been attacked numerous times, and and, and you know all I can say to that is, I, hey, I've been silent for years since Carla Turner died. I haven't tried to get in the limelight. I've avoided it. Uh, you know, and, and the only reason I'm doing it now is because so much more information is coming out now. And I think people need to, to, to know more of the truth. Uh, I, I, I think there's too many uh, loose ends here with everyone about this phenomenon. Uh, it needs to all be pulled together and looked at objectively by science, religion, uh, you name it, uh, average citizens, uh, engineers, what have you, it all needs to be pulled together under one umbrella so it begins to make more sense. And I think I can help do that if people will just listen. I'm not asking them to believe everything I tell them. I have no proof of any of it other than sharing with some of the other people uh that were witnesses to things that happened to me but nevertheless uh you can't just wait on somebody holding a phd in physics to give you the answers we all have got to respect each other and start listening to each other from all avenues of this phenomena for it to start making sense yeah, uh, you know, I couldn't have said it better myself, Ted. There's um, a lot of people. I know there's a lot of uh, debate in the UFO community o over certain things, but uh, there's one thing people generally seem to believe is that after the 1940s, something changed. And that's when you started seeing these mass UFO sightings and these mass abductions. Then right up until the 80s, I think it was 19, 1986, where Bud Hopkins found the first case of a woman talking about the hybrid children. Uh, Ted, can you comment a little bit on the hybrid children? What do you think is going on there? Well, I don't. That it's hard, that's hard for me to uh, give my opinion without opening up uh, more questions to things I'm not ready to answer yet. Right. Uh, so I, I, I want to pass on that at this time, other than I, I will say that uh, I think a hybrid program with the aliens is in existence, but I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure at this time exactly why that exists. Yeah. Um, I was listening to the researcher, David Jacobs, and he was talking about people who are abducted. There's a high degree that their children would also be abducted and then their children and their children. And eventually we will get to the point where there's more abductees than non-abductees. From your knowledge, can you tell if this uh, phenomenon has abated at all, or is it still increasing? Ted, I'm not sure if you leave, if you even know this, but year on year, do you know if abductions are increasing or decreasing? In my personal opinion, I believe that uh, they're increasing. Yeah, that's what I tend to believe as well. Uh, this program, like David Jacobs said, has um, an end, a start. A middle and an end well I, I i will share this with you i uh a couple of people that uh the readers would read about 
uh, in my story in the first few chapters uh, that I have spoken with recently and two of them have agreed to come on as a as a guest and uh we'll be able to communicate with them later on it, it may be a month or two before this can happen but uh uh it would be interesting to get these people's opinion on what they think uh and what what they remember uh going on with me in the early stages of this oh excellent well uh I will say this, it, uh, this wasn't in, um, it wasn't in my story. Okay. But when I was, uh, uh, nine and a, nine to 10 years old and the grandmother event happened, it was in that period, uh, of when I was that age and we were living at this place, it was, uh, uh, a few blocks from our house to a golf course, a very large golf course. And uh, one evening, a friend and, and I, we were kids, we rode our bicycles, it was a summer evening and it was dark and we rode our bicycles down to the golf course. We parked the bikes and we climbed over the little uh, knee high fence that separated the street from the golf course. And we walked out onto one of the greens and all of a sudden appearing before me was uh, a triangular shaped object that I would say was shaped like the pyramids. And then on the bottom, it was inverted the same way. So uh, it, it was both points of the, the pyramids. It was like they were stuck together in the middle and it was slightly glowing. Sort of like a, uh, a diamond, you could say. Yes, like, uh, yeah, like a diamond. That's very good. Uh, now, I don't, I don't know if we were abducted at that time because this was not something that I, re I remembered when Barbara and I were doing all of our intensive uh, re regression work. It never came up. It's just something I remembered recently that that happened. And so this was probably around 19... 49 or 50. Yeah. You know, people in, in some people in the UFO community would accredit those ships to uh, the Pleiadians. Uh, it's exactly the way you described it. This kind of diamond shaped ship with an orange glow. Um, mm -hmm. Now, whether there even are Pleiadians is, is another story of, or if this is just more alien deception, um, we'll never know. But I, I like the idea of these, these, kind of you could say caretakers of humanity in a, in a way of kind of looking out for us um but for people you can you can see there are videos on youtube with the with those ships that ted just described uh, so uh what's well, our sure. let me say, let me say this the the friend that was with me had no recall of that but that... i when I talked to him about what we had seen there on the green that night, he had no recall of it. He was the same age I was. That's interesting because but I did remember it. Yeah, that's that's interesting because. And, and what do you tell a, a, a nine and a half, a 10 year old little boy uh, of what he just saw? Yeah. So uh, I, I think I suppressed it and didn't talk about it with anyone because my friend didn't remember and who would i talk to about it? no one <laughs> there's <laughs> very few people you can talk to so, uh, you know i'm just sh sharing that because i think that's what's happened to so many people uh it, it gets put away yeah yeah people people do think that oh you know, I, I did have a, a strange experience there, but I'll just carry on with the rest of my day. That was a little bit odd, you know, and I'm sure a lot of people will be able to remember inst instances like that. No. Um, although what you're saying with the fact that he doesn't remember, that kind of suggests to me that there was an abduction event. 
Well, I've been curious about that. I wish I had my barber back so I could go under hypnosis. Uh, but we lost her, unfortunately, as we did Carla Turner. So, uh, Ted, maybe, maybe we should talk a little bit about those deaths in this episode. Uh, well, <sighs> Carla and I became very close friends. In fact, she and Barbara actually became the best friends I ever had because for once in my life, I had someone listening to me about what I had been experiencing and it didn't dismiss me as a lunatic. And it was so wonderful to have that. So wonderful. Yeah. And uh, Carla, according to Elton, uh, and I stand corrected, Elton, if you listen to this and I'm wrong, but I believe that Elton had, had, had told me at one time that Carla's health had been deteriorating. However, Carla told me uh that uh she had become a vegetarian and that she really had to watch her diet to uh because she would become anemic uh and her health would appear to be failing and until she corrected that in her diet uh but at any rate where i'm leading to with this is uh Carla told me that she had been warned about uh, speaking publicly about the things that, that we were all finding out. And uh, I know I had been threatened after the book came out, but uh, Carla felt that when she was uh, given a diagnosis of this terminal cancer, that they had done something to her that caused this cancer uh, to uh, affect her the way that it did and so rapidly. Uh, she was not convinced that that was uh, totally an accident, that it was just her health failing. Yeah. Uh, and we talked about it at length. We were close friends. So I listened to her and, and her concerns and worries and her fears about it. Um, I psychically, uh, psychically, I felt that something had been done to her, but there again, you, if being psychic doesn't prove anything. You know, so uh, it, it did no good for me to agree with her, although I did. I tell her, I, t I told her that I agree with that. Uh, now, Barbara, Barbara and her husband got up on Thanksgiving morning about four in the morning and prepared a turkey with all the trimmings to take across town to Barbara's mother who lived in an assisted living facility. And they were going there to have Thanksgiving with her and spend the day with her. This was on Thanksgiving day. Uh, they, they left out about eight 30 or nine o'clock. I think somewhere around that time, Barbara told me to drive over there and they were living in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And the facility of her mother was all the way across town. So it took a little while to get over there, but, uh, Barbara said they were not so very far from, uh, their home when uh, a vehicle uh, at, uh, at very high speed, which Barbara said witnesses said it was uh, a black tinted window Humvee with no tag on it, uh, came out of nowhere and hit them at, at maybe 90 to 100 miles per hour. Their car was accelerated into the air spinning. Barbara and her husband both were thrown out of the vehicle uh, the, the car landed on Barbara's husband, Bob, and he was crushed. He died instantly. And Barbara was sort of trapped between, uh, the, uh, the, uh, her car door had on her side had opened and it kind of made like a little tent the way the car uh, had come down over her and she wasn't crushed. However, she did have multiple, uh, broken bones and fractures, uh, throughout our body and it took her months and months and months to recover from this and a year later 
uh, she was uh, uh, coming along better. She wanted very much for me to move to Tulsa where we could continue doing our hypnotic regressions because Barbara said we had gotten so very much uh, information from those regressions and she wanted to do it. But I was living about 500 miles away and uh, it wasn't easy for me uh, to just, uh, I'd have to sell my home and have to go through a lot of procedure to, to do that. But I finally, I agreed. Uh, and I, at the place where I was employed, I put in for a transfer and they started that procedure. And then three weeks later, they found Barbara uh, unconscious on her floor uh, in her home. And she had uh, had a massive stroke. Uh, from what I was told, the stroke uh, happened it was, uh, in like the very back of, of her head in the exact place that my grandmother's stroke had occurred. And anyway, Barbara did not recover and she passed away within just a few days. And so that's what happened there. Of course, I canceled all plans about moving, moving to Tulsa to be closer to do that work. Yeah. And uh, the aliens here or men in black? Well, at this time, and I, I uh, you know, it may change with me, but at this time, I don't think the aliens care. They know technology wise is absolutely nothing that we can do about uh, what they do or with us. Yeah. Uh, we have no way to compete with it. Uh, the men in black, I'm, I, I don't know about their origin other than I'm very suspicious that that could be a covert operation between our government and a group of aliens. Uh, but I don't know that for a fact that it would be just uh, uh, hypothetical uh, thinking on my part to assume that. But that's kind of the way I feel today. Yeah. Know what I know. Uh, okay, Ted, we are at the hour, so we will uh, end this uh, end this episode here. Uh, well, I would like to end with this on all of them. I would love all the audience to be uh, to think about our our home, Mother Earth, and we we humans are destroying Mother Earth, and she's all we got, and we need to start paying attention to what we're doing and we need to push big business to clean up their act and the oceans and all of, all of the negative things that we're doing to our planet that eventually is going to wipe us out but it's going to be too late before we do anything if we don't start paying attention now. So I ask everybody listen, let's all join together and let's take care of Mother Earth. Rice. Um, Rice, uh, until uh, the next episode, Ted. All right.